Um, if I could solve this problem in 41 minutes, you'd have to name more than this hall after me. Um, <laughs> actually, I heard uh, the rector's Easter sermon, and I, I'd have to have a bigger statue than Ferdinand de Lesseps if, uh, if I could solve this in 41 minutes. So I'm going to try. I want to divide it into three parts. Uh, first, I want to talk about the problem of evil in light of modern science. And then I want to take uh, two words from the first article of our creeds, whether it be Apostle, Nicene, or Athanasian, Father Almighty. And then I hope I can send you out of here um, with uh, some positive thoughts to help you through the week. Let's start with modern science. We can no longer do theology as if Copernicus never existed, as if Galileo never existed. We cannot be um, scientists on Friday and then come to church on Sunday and leave our brains parked outside the church. In our mission statement back in Doylestown, which I helped to write, it starts off grounded in tradition, which is why I love this church. Uh, how do you improve on the Book of Common Prayer? The Lutherans do have Bach, which is right up there with the Book of Common Prayer. But, and then secondly, it says guided by intellect which means that I don't think uh, we can leave our brains parked outside the church. So let's start with this tremendous problem of evil and suffering by way of modern science. Way back in the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas said, evil is one of the chief obstacles to Christian faith, the other being man's ability to explain the world without reference to a creator. And that was the 13th century. I mean, talk about now, I mean, that was before Copernicus, it was before Galileo, it was before Darwin. And now those issues are even more prominent. There are many materialists that say, it's all just an accidental collocation of atoms. There's no need to bring God or a creator into any of these discussions. One of my favorite theologians on this topic is John Haught. I was teaching at Catholic University in the 80s uh, in homiletics, which is preaching, and he was chair of theology at Georgetown, and he has since become, I think, a leading authority on relating science and theology. He writes in his recent book that the world's still coming into bloom. We heard in Revelation last week that God is Alpha and Omega. Hort would say God is more Omega than Alpha. 3.8 billion years ago was the debut of life. Conscious awareness a few million years ago. If I had 30 volumes since the first Big Bang, and you took the last paragraph of the last page of the 30th volume, that's when we humans appear. So as Tennyson said in his uh, wonderful poem on death and grief in memoriam, red with tooth and claw, that's how we come into this world, red in tooth and claw. So what do we say to the materialist? Hort makes the point, how can the interplay of dumbness and darkness manufacture minds whose main function is to rescue us from dumbness and darkness? Many would say the brain is to the mind what a computer hardware is to computer software. But most of us feel something's missing. What Augustine was getting at when he said, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. You could describe, our music people certainly here, could describe Elgar's cello concerto. Some would say it's the rubbing of horse hair over cat cut. And while that description, that description would be true as far as it went, but we lose its essence, its soul. Materialism, while cogent and persuasive in so many ways, seems to be missing something. And what's missing is that call forward. Yes, God often fails, we're not puppets. Humans often derail God's purposes, but we believe that God is working his purposes out in an unfinished and incomplete world. Unfortunately, we don't have any great hymns that express this. There's one that could be um, sung to Wareham or Rock, Rockingham Old. It's creations, Lord, we give thee thanks that this thy world is incomplete. And that's a thought that I'm suggesting 
that if the world's 3.8 billion years old and we just entered the whole evolutionary process on the last page of 30 volumes, God is working his purposes out um, and we are in that process. I think that helps a little bit. And that raises the question then, what do we do with the story of Genesis and Adam and Eve and the fall? We certainly can't look at it as history, as if Adam and Eve were real people walking in a garden and they were innocent and then they ate the apple. Um, Harvey Cox was teaching at Harvard when he wrote his book uh, on leaving it to the snake. Um, why did you eat the apple? The woman gave me the apple. So we blame the woman gave me the apple. And the woman says, the snake made me do it. How did you do on your report card, Johnny? I got an A in French, and that lousy teacher gave me a D in Spanish. <laughs> so what is the sin here? It, it, it's what Harvey Cox calls sloth, which is one of the seven deadly sins, an unwillingness to assume responsibility for the direction of our lives. So we take these stories and we say, they may not be literally true, but they're eternally true. Someone said of a legend that everything about a legend is true except the facts. <laughs> and that's true. Take the Wizard of Oz. Is it true? I asked my eighth grade confirmation class, is it true? And most of them say, ah, it's a story. But really, what does it mean to be integrated, to be whole, to be saved? It's to have a mind to think and a heart to feel and courage to act. So when we go deeper, of course the story is true. Not literally, but always true. So what do we do with the fall then? Well, Paul Tillich said that there comes a point where creation and the fall coincide. Or as Niebuhr put it, there comes a point where we sin inevitably, but not necessarily. And that's getting at that truth that we all experience existentially. Uh, I just watched that movie, uh, The Devil, uh, where's Prada? I got the, at the library, I saw it, and wow, that was really good. D did she have freedom? Most of us would say, sure. You know, did she sell her soul for less than 30 pieces of silver? We know in our own lives that whereas environment and heredity influence our behavior, there still comes a point where we say, it wasn't my mother, it wasn't my father, it wasn't my genes, it wasn't my environment, it's me standing in the need of prayer. So I believe the fall can, needs in our day, in a post-Darwinian, post-Copernican, post-Galilean world, un, needs to be understood existentially, but, but not as something historical. Otherwise, I mean, we'd be denying what 99% of our scientists are, are teaching us. So that's the first thing I want to say, that the world is incomplete and is still in process. Um, years ago, a woman came up to me and she said, why do we always have confession every week on our knees? It sounds kind of depressing. And um, I said to her, well, you know, it is the only empirically verifiable doctrine of the church, original sin, when you think about it. And, uh, and she was German, and I couldn't believe it, you know, coming out of the post-Holocaust as she wonders why we're on our knees. So I, I'm suggesting that the world is still in process and growing, and if we're going to understand and deal with theological concepts like the fall, uh, we need to deal with them existentially in light of modern science. Second thing I want to say is I want to take those two words that are in all three creeds. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. I'm suggesting that we cannot understand the word almighty without the word Father. What is power? Power is the ability to achieve purpose. We can't understand power without the ability to achieve purpose. And God's power manifests itself persuasively, not coercively. By that I mean, if you're parents, you could put a collar around your child, I guess, or ankle like you would on invisible fences with dogs, and you know, some people do that, and control the dog and the child totally, but the child would not be free to respond freely. So Soren Kierkegaard told a great story once about a prince who fell in love with a maiden, 
and uh, he wanted her to love him, not because he had power, not because he had money, but for who he was. So he takes up residence in her little town, and gets a job as a carpenter, and after some three years proposes. What Kierkegaard was trying to say was that just as God takes on human flesh in Jesus and becomes one of us, he does so unobtrusively, he does so persuasively, he does so in a hidden way, what Luther called deus absconditus, the hiddenness of God, or what the theologian John Hick calls epistemic distance, epistemology meaning knowledge, that there's always that text in Exodus, my back parts you will see, but not my face. There's always that mystery and that hiddenness in the presence of God so as not to destroy our freedom, which is what I love about a high church because we don't do away with the mystery. It's been said that when Jesus died, they say darkness covered the earth from, from what, 12 to three, and some Scottish theologian said, that's so nobody could go home and say they saw it all. There is that sense of awe and mystery in the presence of God that we don't have all the answers. Which is what I love about the Book of Common Prayer, that there is a capaciousness that allows there to be the, the mystery and the hiddenness. What I'm suggesting with that word power is that love is self-restricting when it comes to power. Um, someone said, if you don't demand credit for things, you can push them through. I think any leader knows that, that if you can get out of the way, you don't demand credit. There is that unobtrusiveness, that hiddenness, that he's crucified outside the city wall. He, he, he's born in an inn outside the stable. Always with God there is that hiddenness, that unobtrusiveness, so that we become free. So it, it isn't helpful to use the word power as if God can do anything. The power is always wed to his nature. There was a king who was going to put to death some Scotsman, and the Scotsman who was about to be hung said, Your Majesty, I mean, the king said to the Scotsman, you know it's in my power to release or hang you. And the Scotsman, knowing he was going to be hung, said, it may be in your power, your majesty, but it's not in your nature. <laughs> so if God's power is one of persuasion, if love is self-restricting when it comes to power, then... As Jürgen Moltmann, a great theologian, told a story of God, the crucified God, that God suffers on Good Friday. It's not the suffering uh, of nails and crucifixion, but it's the suffering of a parent when a child suffers. So Elie Wiesel, in his novel Night, tells of a little boy that the Nazis have hung, and he's so light that he's not really dying right away. And somebody says, where is God? And someone nearby said, God is there hanging with him on the gallows. Since Jürgen Moltmann's book, many others have come out about God is a God who suffers with us and keeps his distance, as difficult as that may be, because it's in the nature of love to keep one's distance. And that's a tough one, but we say it every week. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. And just as a father cannot wield power and have a child grow up to be strong and healthy, so God has to keep his, what Hick calls epistemic distance. Um, you parents, if you've ever dropped your kids off at college, you know, you cry all the way home, <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? Um, when I was in college, you know, I'd call home and say, uh, um, collect call from Robert Linders, and my mother would say in her Jersey accent, he's not here! <laughs> <You know? laughs> that, that, way, that way she'd know I got home safe. But boy, when my daughter went off to college, Dad, I'm walking to class, you know, Dad, I'm here. I mean, now it's a whole different world. But you still, when you drive, them, oh, drive off and you, you let them be, and um, McGregor, a great Scottish theologian, titled the book, The God Who Lets Us Be. And it's not because he doesn't love us, it's because the nature of love is persuasive, not coercive. Um, 
So those are my uh, two thoughts to start off with. Uh, first of all, we cannot do our theology without coming to grips with modern science. And then secondly, I think we have to understand Father and Almighty. Now the third thing I want to say, which I hope is more comforting in some ways, goes back to a British preacher, Leslie Weatherhead. Um, he was at City Temple in London. I think he was a Methodist, but when the bombs hit City Temple, he started worshiping at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church. And a, a lot of people become Anglicans in old age, you know, I don't know what it is. Um, someone said, you guys aren't great in obstetrics, but you're great in gerontology. <laughs> you know, sort of like a finishing school. <laughs> um, but I mean that as a compliment. Uh, I mean, look, think of them all. Fred Beekner, you know, he's in an Episcopal church. Uh, I think your rector went a little far in calling Updike an Episcopalian. Everyone knows he's a Lutheran, but I mean, that was a little far. <laughs> but um, a little liberty <laughs> goes a long way. Anyway, what I'm suggesting is that um, in the, Weatherhead ultimately ended up appreciating much of the Anglican tradition. So he wrote a little book that sold millions of copies called The Will of God. God's intentional will is what God intends, that we live together in love and kindness with one another. Then there's God's circumstantial will. That's the evil things that happen in the world because of two things, natural law and human freedom. If I fall out of a cliff, I don't turn into Indian rubber and bounce up and down. Chesterton said, you don't break the law of gravity, you prove it. So there's a sense in which we all know that we live in a law-abiding universe. And a lot of evil that happens, tsunamis and other things are the result of n natural law. And then there's freedom. I mean, you can read all you want about Hitler and Putin, but I mean, it's the abuse of freedom. It may grow out of a pride, you know, talk about the human depravity of human nature. It may grow out of pride, but a lot of evil happens because of um, the abuse of human freedom and because of natural law. The real problem comes with what's been called dysteleological suffering, teleos meaning the end, dis meaning not, that suffering that doesn't seem to achieve any good purpose. So somebody gets a heart attack and they say, I've spent too much time at the office. When Paul Sungus had cancer, he said, nobody in their deathbed ever said, I wish I spent more time at the office. He was walking through Boston and a taxi driver put down the window and said, she's better. He was walking with his 10-year-old daughter. She's better than a Senate seat. Sometimes suffering will do that. It makes us deeper. What doesn't make us bitter can make us better. The real problem with theodicy is the problem of suffering that doesn't seem to achieve any good purpose, which is where I think eschatology becomes very important, that if nothing matters um, ultimately, it's hard to see that anything matters presently. The third um, understanding of the will of God is not the intentional or circumstantial, but what Weatherhead calls the ultimate will of God, and that's that God is always at work bringing good out of evil. So the great Augustine said, Felix culpa, God deemed it better to bring good out of evil than not to have evil to exist. And I can't go into Augustine in two minutes, but his whole idea of contrast the sea is no less beautiful because ships are broken on it. So how do we understand good if there's no evil? How do we understand light if we don't understand darkness? Always there is this contrast, a kind of tentative dualism or uh, a dualism that we believe will not be forever, that ultimately history is God's story, but because of the persuasive nature of God, it's like playing chess with God in the hope that God will always win, and that's our eschatological Easter hope, that Pilate had Jesus crucified, put a period after the deed, but God changed the period to a comma, for the story is to be continued, and that's this great Easter tide. Let me give you a nice example from Enterprise, Alabama. I probably, nobody here knows Enterprise, Alabama. But um, I, uh, I can tell you this, it comes, it, it's two hours from a place that everybody in Sarasota knows, the great metropolis of Linden. It's, uh, it's I looked it up on the map, and it, it's two hours from Linden, uh, Alabama. Okay, there is a bull weevil in the center of Enterprise, Alabama. Now you would say, why in the world would you put a statue up to a bug that kills the great 
Cotton Enterprise. Well, guess what comes after cotton was destroyed? Peanuts, right? Maybe it never would have happened. So providence, the doctrine of providence, always has to be understood retrospectively. No one said it better than Paul Tellick, the theologian. He said, providence is not an efficiently working machine. Rather, providence means that there is a saving possibility implied in every situation. And it's us to, uh, up to us as best we can to cooperate. Now, Luther didn't want to hear anything about cooperation because of his great belief that it ends up being works righteousness. So let me give you a wonderful example of grace. As I, uh, an eighth grade boy has a crush on this girl in his class and she must get wind of it. So she puts a little note on his desk, call me. Now, did he have a choice to call her? Luther would probably say no that her love elicited the response. So when we respond with a, a life of loyalty and greatness, we, we say the Holy Spirit called and enlightened me and, and was responsible. That's what we mean by the primacy of grace. So we believe that God is always what John Claypool in this wonderful book, he, a Baptist, 30 years a Baptist, and he ended up at St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Birmingham, another one of your uh, late life disciples. Well, actually, <laughs> actually he went through a divorce because his 12 year old daughter died of leukemia, and when she died, he, he, he was just overcome with grief, and um, Episcopal Church was more forgiving than, than his Baptist heritage. And the story I like is that he was just overcome with grief and at three o'clock in the morning, he goes downstairs and he pulls Von Raj's commentary off the shelf of the book of Genesis to Isaac being sacrificed, God asking Isaac to sacrifice his son. And Claypool says, it finally came to me that this son of mine is a gift. And the only appropriate response to a gift is gratitude. And he said, after all this suffering and grief and pain, I had to make the decision of whether I'd be grateful for the 12 years I had or bitter over the years I did not have. And he said it was a, a God experience, a transforming experience in his life. And he wrote this little book called That God is an Ingenious Alchemist. And at the end, he talks about Joseph and all that happened in the story of Joseph where, um, it says here, consider that if Jacob had not showed favoritism that he did, neither Joseph nor his brothers would have matured. If the brothers had not sold Joseph into slavery, he would not have been in a position to save so many from starvation. If Joseph had remained with Jacob, who never asked him of anything, he might not have matured as he did under Potiphar. Had Potiphar's wife not done what she did, Joseph would never have come to the attention of Pharaoh. And the point that Claypool is making is that God's always at work in the crucible of human experience, always at work with us. Uh, I went saw, sailing once at St. Croix, and we made it to Buck Island in, uh, in um, about 20 minutes. It took two hours to get back because it was against the wind, and you have to tack when you're against the wind. And what Claypool would say that God is in that tacking in using contrary forces to somehow achieve his purposes and that ultimately, you know, his will will prevail. And that brings us back to Augustine's Felix Culpa, or Whitehead, the father of modern process theology says, redemption through suffering haunts the world. What used to be called patropassionism, that God suffers with us, but doesn't just suffer with us, but always ultimately will win the day because we believe that love is longer than hate. And in the end, that's our eschatological hope. It's not something that I can prove empirically, but I can't prove that love is better than hate. I can't prove that beauty, I, I can prove that the uh, dimensions of a picture, but I can't prove that it's beautiful. If somebody jumps in to save, say, a child with special needs, I can test the water and say it's 48 degrees, but I can't say it was courageous. I can't say that, um, whoa, that woman is, uh, I can prove 130 pounds, but I can't prove the love. 
we all know that the love and the beauty and the courage, things that we can't put under a microscope, those are things that are real, or as Paul said, how did he put it, um, the things that are transient, you know, they pass away, and the things that are eternal that we cannot see. So those are my three points. Wow, not 41 minutes. But I would say first, let's understand the problem of evil in light of modern science, that the world is, is in process and we're new to it and God's still at work, the more omega than alpha. Then let's talk about power as the ability to achieve purpose. And then let's talk about the eschatological presence of God in his intentional, circumstantial, and ultimate will, ultimately taking a minus and turning it into a, to a plus, which is the shape of the cross. I mean, that's a Christus Victor there. So, I mean, that's uh, an, Easter, an Easter image, not one of Christ's suffering on the cross as a crucifix, but as a sign of, uh, of a risen Christ who took the worst thing that ever happened and turned it into the best. And if we can take an instrument of torture like an electric chair and hang it around our necks and put it on our churches, um, that's at the very least a sign of hope. You know, that God is the great alchemist who is working with us. So, any questions, boy? <laughs> oh, I'm not supposed to move. <laughs> any thoughts? Um, Tom Long is a great preacher. Um, he's still a Presbyterian. He hasn't come to Adventism <laughs> yet. We are praying for her. And at the very end, he has this Latin phrase, salvatur ambulanta, which means sometimes you have to live through it. It's not an academic exercise. You know, you learn by walking. I think that's what he's saying by salvatur ambulato. It means literally it is solved by walking. It's not solved just by an academic exercise. You, you have to, Abraham Heschel, a great Jewish uh, theologian, Abraham Heschel said after the Selma walk that he was praying with his feet when he walked with Martin Luther King at Selma. He said later to his students at Columbia, I was praying with my feet. Sometimes we enter the kingdom head first, sometimes we enter heart first. But I think as often as not, we enter the kingdom feet first. So, um, by, by living it, walking was a form of praying. Or someone said of music that when you sing, you pray twice. Um, and, and sometimes in our deepest despair, it's the music that, that keeps us going. So that um, I don't think any can replace the great music of the church. Uh, you know, I shouldn't. I should say something good about our Lutheran Bach. Uh, he once, um, he once uh, was called a punk, uh, but to somebody, William Buckley had his firing line show, and some activist came on uh, William Buckley's show, and he called Bach a punk. And Buckley, who played the harpsichord and loved good music, he looked at him and he said, "You call a punk the greatest genius who ever lived." the least of whose cantatas has done more to elevate the human spirit than all the caucuses that ever met. <laughs> so what I'm suggesting is that I find as I get older, tremendous, tremendous comfort in the great music of the church. You know, uh, the Lutheran chorales, the Anglican uh, hymnody. I mean, I, I just love the, uh, the great music, uh, you know, of our traditions. You remind me of the sermon Father Eicher gave one time. He said, Jesus never promised to protect us from the storm. He promised to be with us in the storm. Great. Did you all hear that? He said, Jesus did not promise to protect us from the storm, but in the storm. Or here's a line similar to that. In this world, God offers us minimum protection and maximum support. How's that? <laughs> and I think that's true. Uh, minimum protection and maximum support. So sometimes people say to me, um, what should I say when somebody loses a child or goes through some terrible thing? Uh, the last thing you want to do is say too much. I mean, don't say to somebody with three kids who loses one to leukemia, well, be glad you have two other kids. 
I, I mean, don't say that. <laughs> what you want to say is simply, I'm sorry. And then bring a nice casserole, you know, a blueberry pie with the blueberries run after the juice, something like that, you know, that's comforting to somebody, not by trying to say too much. So I think being with somebody, um, I think, is the best way you can be of comfort. Or when someone's suffering, I, loses a child, I try to find somebody else who has lost a child. So Thornton Wilder says in uh, one of his plays that in the Lord's army only the wounded can serve. In the Lord's army, only the wounded can serve. So, I mean, if you've been through, if somebody's been through a great pain, and you know somebody's been through a great pain, you begin, you share the grief. When my mother had dementia in the last few years of her life, uh, a member of our church, he said, "I'm going to drive you to see your mom." It was a 40-minute ride, and I wanted to go every uh, week. She didn't really know who I was, but I wanted to know she was being cared for, so I would go unannounced just to see you know, how the nurses were taking care of her. And then sometimes I didn't want to talk driving back and I'd treat him to lunch. And I said later that his great gift to me was that he thinned out my grief. And I think by being present with someone, you can help thin out, thin out a person's grief, even if you can't, you know, undo, undo the loss. And I love that phrase in the Lord's army, only the wounded can serve, so we become fellow sufferers, which is a you know, wonderful gift to somebody.